Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Give you a very warm welcome uh, to you as we gather for worship and for those who will listen in to our service later on. It's nice to be back with you. Um, sorry I brought the rain with me. Um, it had been glorious weather. Um, I don't think we've seen it in, in many years. Um, and so it was nice just to have a bit of a break. And now we begin uh, the, the ramp up again. Uh, for a new season and for what God might have in store for us. One announcement that you're probably aware of, uh, I regretfully have to inform you of, uh, sadly, another uh, bereavement in our congregation, the passing of Mrs. Molly Dixon. Um, so we'll be remembering uh, the Dixon family, Stephen, Alana and Tommy, and the family circle in our prayers later on this morning. So we come to worship. We come to focus our heart on the God that loves us and saves us. It's Son Jesus Christ who went to the cross to give us hope and life and forgiveness of sins. To put him first in our lives, to give him our heart and our worship. As the psalmist reminds us, rejoice in the Lord and be glad be righteous. Sing all you who are upright in heart. And so we do that this morning as we come and sing our first hymn of praise. Come now is the time to worship. We'll stand and worship God. Come to talk with us this morning. 
So we thank you we can come with our doubts. We thank you that we can come with our crisis of faith. We thank you that we can come, Lord, with, with those things in our lives that we know are not right before you, and yet we lay them before you and ask that you may cleanse us, forgive us, help us, grant us your peace. That as we worship you, as we declare that you are first in our lives, that above you there is no other. We thank you that you will come and visit with us. You will inhabit our faces. You will give us a heart and a, a thoughts to worship you this morning. Eyes to see you, ears to hear you. That you might fill us anew with your Holy Spirit. So as we come this morning, we also pray, come Holy Spirit. Touch us this morning. Draw near to us with your power and with your peace. That Lord, you may transform us. And that as we arise and go from here this morning, we will do so knowing that we have met with the living God. For we ask our prayers in Jesus' precious name. We turn to God's words from over the next few weeks. I'm, I'm hoping to do a little series again, sort of called Encounters with God. I know there'll be holidays for some, and, and folk will be in and out over the month of August, but um, they're connected, but also stand alone. But let us hear God's word. As we see how Jesus touched the lives who came to him. And so we read this morning from Mark's Gospel, Mark chapter 10, beginning with verse 17, in the story of the rich ruler. Let us hear God's word. As Jesus started on his way, a man ran up to him, fell on his knees before him. Good teacher, he asked. What must I do to inherit eternal life? Why do you call me good, Jesus answered. No one is good except God alone. You know the commandment. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not give false testimony. You shall not defraud, honour your father and mother. Teacher, he declared, all these I have kept since I was a boy. Jesus looked at him and loved him. One thing we lack, he said, go sell everything you have and give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come, follow me. At this the man's face fell. He went away sad because he had great wealth. And Jesus looked round and said to his disciples, how hard is it for the rich to enter the kingdom of God? The disciples were amazed at his words. But Jesus said again, Children, how hard it is to enter the kingdom of God. It is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for someone who is rich to enter the kingdom of God. The disciples were even more amazed and said to each other, Who then can be saved? Jesus looked at them and said, With man this is impossible. But not with God. All things are possible with God. Amen. And we know that God will add a blessing to this the reading of His holy word. I wasn't sure if we would have any boys and girls out this morning. But I want to take a, a little moment and, and to think about this story. And think of it in, in simplistic terms. Man has come looking at an answer to a great question. How can I get to heaven? And so Jesus speaks to him and he tells him about keeping the commandments. I suppose we might say about, about being good. 
And so the man says, oh, I, I've done that. Now, for the grown-ups, we know that if we ask our children, and you've maybe done so down through the years, who did that? You all look at you and go, wasn't me. We know when we've gone wrong, we know that we are not perfect 100% of the time. Your minister is not perfect 100% of the time. Did you know that? Or has that taken you by surprise this morning? We all have our feelings. We all have our flaws. We all get it wrong somewhere. And Jesus said that. That's good. He, he loved them. He, he saw his hunger for the things of God and yet he realized he was looking at the wrong thing. He says, one thing you lack. One more thing you need. Sell everything you have. Give it all away. Clear out the house. Give it to the poor. And I come and follow me to life of discipleship. A life where there will be no home or or bed to lie in. The man's face fell and was very limp. But really what Mark was trying to say to us as he's writing this, his face fell and he was very rich because he loved his riches more than he loved Jesus. And that's the thing, you know, what do we love? I don't know if you can see some of this stuff. I, I, I wrote down this, this is a heart. It's not a very good heart, and apologies to any of the medical people here, and the colour and so on. But what I love, I, I love my family. Many would say we, we love our clothes. You know the way you see those, those programmes where, where people are building new houses and stuff and they have walk-in wardrobes? I, I don't have a walk-in wardrobe. Um, I have clothes that I, I really like and others that I have to wear, I think. We love our stuff. Maybe our TV, our, our gadgets, our, our games, our, our Playstations, our, our Nintendos, all these various things. We love our friends. But sometimes our friends can, can lead us astray. Sometimes being with our friends, stop us from following Jesus. And that's the whole thing. Some of this stuff, all of it is good. But sometimes it takes us away from following Jesus. And what Jesus was saying, that stuff's okay, but really this is the important thing. I have to be first. I have to be over all those things. I wrote there, I, I love my work. But first and foremost, I have to love Jesus first. As a follower of Jesus Christ, that has to be my first priority, my walk with God. And once we get that right, then all this other stuff, which is good, can fall into its proper place. That we put Jesus first. We want what he wants for us. Later on in the sermon, I'll, I'll talk about two athletes, right at the very end of it, two, two athletes who put Jesus first, who wants Jesus first in their life. It's not the fame, the fortune. It's not the recognition. It's not the adulation. It's Jesus. And that's what Jesus was trying to say to this man when he came. You can follow the rules, you can do all the good stuff, but this is the important thing. Put me first beyond all others, and then everything else falls into place. We're going to sing a song that reminds us of that. It's Jesus' own words uh, from, from Matthew's Gospel. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. Hallelujah. We'll keep our seats as we sing this phrase.
so we come to our prayers of intercession. We think about those who are grieved, those who are suffering. But we're also going to remember something of great joy that is next Saturday, Rebecca Bisp and Dylan Hughes will come here to this church and be joined together in matrimony. They will come and take their bodies. And so we will remember Rebecca and Dylan in our prayers and pray for them as they get all the last wee bits of organisation sorted and that all will go well next Saturday for them as they begin their life together in marriage. Let's pray. Father, you remind us that you care about all the things of our life. So as we think about the passage that we have sung from, that you've told us, do not worry. That you have reminded us that our Heavenly Father cares for us. And acts, Lord, when we come to heaven and prayer. And so right now, Lord, we come for those who are mourning, for those who are grieved. So we lift up the Dixon family to you this morning. We pray for, for Stephen, Alana and Tommy and for the wider family circle. That as once more this family is plunged into grief, as once more they have to deal with the loss of a parent, that you will draw near to them, that they might know your comfort and peace, that they might be aware, Lord, that you are with them, and that they can turn to you for their strength, for their refuge at this time in their life. Surround them with your love. Be near to them with your presence. That in the days that lie ahead, they may become more and more aware that you are indeed a God of love and a God who cares for them and a God who is with them. We think of others too this morning who have lost loved ones. We pray that you might indeed strengthen them and help them. That you might be their rock, the one that they cling to and hold on to. And know in the midst of the darkness you will bring light and warmth and love. For those who continue on this journey of sadness, Lord, travel with them. Be their strength for each day. Be there in those moments of tears, those moments of happiness, that through the highs and lows, that they may know that you love them with an everlasting love. Remember those two this morning who are awaiting treatment, awaiting perhaps consultation and surgeries that have been cancelled, put back because of the COVID crisis, who, Lord, are filled with anxiety and worry, who are just wondering what the future holds for them. Lord, may they put their hand in you and know that you have a plan for them, that your will for them is perfect, and that, Lord, that you will indeed guide them, guide them through the valley, guide them ever onwards, that they might trust in you. To those who are caring for loved ones, who will see days that are really scary and difficult, to, to other days that are good and, and filled with joy, Lord, strengthen them. Fill them with patience. Fill them with love. May memories of times past be a comfort to them. The Lord indeed that they may be assured that you have not forsaken them, nor forgot about them. Perhaps too, Lord, we, we remember those this morning who are anxious. That as we, we hear and we read about uh, things opening up again and and everything is sort of coming to an normality. 
And yet we also read of the daily numbers of, of COVID cases, new cases getting higher and higher. Lord, we wonder what is the best thing to do. How do we manage this? How do we live with this? How, how do we keep ourselves safe? And so, Lord, we entrust it all into your hand. We pray that we might listen to those who are wise. And trust, Lord, that perhaps they have, have sought your face and, and all these things. And have a heart for, for good and for people. And again, just know, Lord, that you are with us. And that you are aware of all these things. Because you are sovereign. Father, we thank you that you have given a gift of family and of marriage. And so we think of Rebecca and Dylan this morning. We pray as they entered into this last week. And for all the, the preparations still to come as, as families come together and, and celebrate this wonderful moment in their lives together. We pray as they come into church to take their vows, you might give them real strength, real commitment, a real determination. As they take their vows in, in your presence and, and before a congregation again, that you will inhabit those vows, live in their hearts, strengthen them to keep those vows day and daily. And that the love that will bring them to this place will, will just grow day by day. And this will be a special moment in their lives together. So we pray for their families. We pray for a good day. We pray for good weather. We, we ask, Lord, that you will just be there in the midst of them. As we celebrate. Father, our joy may be complete in you. Hear our prayers this morning. For we ask them in the precious name of Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Rico Tice at the beginning of this Christianity Explored course asks, or, or sort of puts it out to the group, if you could ask God one question, what, and you would be answered, what would it be? What about suffering? What about assurance that we can know that we're, we're going to get to heaven? What about fairness? How bad people seem to get away with stuff and, and the good seem to suffer. We have lots of questions. And in our passage, this man comes to Jesus with a good question. As you read it, you, you see a, a, a certain amount of movement. Mark records that, that Jesus is on the move. As he started on his way. And as I thought about that, starting on the way, often in biblical terms when we talk about the way, we talk about the path of discipleship. But as Jesus is going on to do what the Father has decided for him, the, the next part of the mission on earth, this man comes to him. When you go home, read again this, this passage and, and go back a bit and, and forward a bit. But as you go back, you, you read that Jesus blessed the little children. The disciples were bringing the children to Jesus. The disciples were stopping him, and Jesus said, Unless you receive the kingdom of God like a little child, you will not enter. That puzzled them. Because it was only when children reached the age of understanding that that's when people began to see their value, began to see that they were part of the kingdom. Prior to that, there, it was a bit grey. So Jesus is already setting the scene. You have to come like little children to me. You have to come with simple faith and trust and dependence. That's how you enter the kingdom. 
And so one comes running. One has maybe heard this and, and rushes to Jesus to try and catch out. Well, well, hold on a second. Am I doing it right? I've reached the age of understanding. I'm now keeping the commandments. Have the goalposts changed? And so he takes his chance before Jesus leaves. So he comes and asks him this great question. What must I do to inherit eternal life? What must I do? This was no test nor trap. It was a sincere request, but still a flaw. When we go to some of the old hymns, we, we get an answer to this. Nothing in my hands I bring, simply to the cross I cling. For just as I am, I come. We said in the beginning, just as we are, we come to worship. It's not about really keeping. It's about being honest and, and real with God and open to the work of the Holy Spirit. He says, good teacher. Jesus challenges on us. Only God is good. Are you saying that I am God or, or have you mixed up what goodness is all about? For this man, goodness is about performance. It's about keeping to the letter of the law. Today we talk about Jesus as a good teacher. We see his, his interaction with people in the Bible where he was kind, he healed, he mixed with sinners and the unclean. He loved people. And so that's where people come to. Well, well, that's what Christianity is about, is just being nice to people and, and loving people. But what Jesus was saying to them, to be good in God is to be holy. It is to be righteous. It is to be in that right relationship with God. To have obedience to the will of the Father. To come and to follow him. To deal with our sinfulness. And trusting only in Jesus. Not our perceived goodness. So he asks. I missed something. Is there some little bit that I'm not fulfilling? And Jesus speaks to him about the commandments. You know them. And so he quotes the seventh, the sixth, the eighth, the ninth, the fifth. And as he's beginning to do that. But you know yourself, if somebody asks you a question, you're maybe at an interview or, or you're at a table quiz or whatever happens, and here's the, the big golden moment. This, this is the bit where you're going to win the prize. And, and somebody asks a question, you think, I know the answer. And you can almost start to feel your chest puff out. You get relaxed. You smile. I've done that, he says. I've kept them. But he butts in to what Jesus was going to say. He interrupts him almost. What would we have said if the man said to us, I've kept them all? Well, nobody can. Nobody's that big. We see all these ones on the TV and whatever, and they're all puffing themselves up, and, and we're cynical. Look what Jesus was. He looks at him and he loves him. He realizes he's sincere. He realizes he wants the answer to the question. But he also realizes that he doesn't know the answer that it's going to come to. Jesus didn't try to ruin this young man's life. He doesn't try to ruin our lives with a call to discipleship to follow him. He wants to give him and us something better. The man comes to me for the answer, but maybe jumps in too soon. But one thing he lacks, he says, one thing. And he pins his finger on maybe the first and second of the commandments. You shall have no other gods before you. You shall not make an idol to yourself of anything or worship. His money was his idol. His wealth was his God. 
He is self-sufficient. I live well and I don't need to have faith in God's provision. I'll be able to sort this all out for myself. If it was his possessions, though they were the problem, that could maybe be dealt with, but, but it was his ultimate loyalty, where he put his trust, what he put first in his life. And Jesus needs to perform radical surgery. And to those listening men, this is, this is massive. He's already confused over the fact that children will enter into heaven. To them it was the great and the good, the rich, because that was a sign of blessing from God. A first pick on anyone's name. Jesus says to them, you don't meet the mark. And here's what you need to do. I wonder what we might have said. Somebody comes to us with this uh, abundance of wealth or, or, or putting something before Jesus. Do we, do we sort of hedge our bets, fudge the issue? Do we, we sort of tiptoe round it all? And, and yet Jesus puts his finger right in the very heart. He often does that in our own way. But we may come and say, Lord, what I can do you. And he points at it. And all of a sudden, that, that part of our life where we're not prepared to surrender, we're not prepared to give that up, we're not prepared to take the step that we think that he wants us to do. He says to him, come and follow me. He uses the same words to this man as he spoke to Peter, James and George. He walked away from their fishing boat. To others who walked away from, from their tax collecting. To, to others who, who moved away completely from, from the life they had before and, and sought to walk with Jesus. Jesus loved them. And he wanted to have the answer to the question he needed of eternal life. But when the man heard it, the Bible tells us his face fell, his head dropped. He slumped down, he got to his feet, he walked away. Did, did the crowd open up behind him? Did silence fall when they suddenly realized that this person that they thought was almost a she into heaven being told it's not enough. There's another way. He said he kept it all. Jesus told him, give it all. And the disciples wondered, well, well, is there anyone at all who can be saved? We go back. The disciples stopped the children from coming to Jesus. They weren't important to them. This man who, who they thought would, would almost be a serf in through the door, right up at the front of the queue, is being told it's not enough. It's not about the rules, it's about the relationship, about the trust, about the dependence on Jesus alone. He talks about a camel entering through the eye of the needle. I don't know about you, but you know when you try to, to thread a needle, where you get a needle and you're squinting and whatever it is, and you're going and, and you're almost there, and then you, you break through the thread, and how many times you have to cut it and twist it and all the rest of it. If we can't get that little bit of thread through the eye of the needle, imagine a camel. Hyperbole is what some people talk about. It was exaggeration. I've told you a million times from this book, but do not exaggerate. If we put it into today's parlance, it's like me trying to get a cat in through a cat flap, in through the door. Could it happen? No, but you'd laugh at me, wouldn't you? It's almost impossible. But is it about richness? Is it about the fact we need to empty 
our bank balance, should, should we have a basin at the front that you could just come and put your gold and platinum and whatever other coloured credit cards you have and throw them in there and give me your pin number and say, that's for the church, that's for God? Or is it the fact that if that's first, if that's where we focus on, that actually all we pursue in life is those things above and beyond God, well then that's not, it's not right. And it'll be difficult to enter the kingdom of God because we are dependent on ourselves. One of the modern hymn writers puts it like this, I'm giving you my heart and all that is within. I lay it all down for the sake of you, my King. I'm giving you my dreams, I'm laying down my rights. I'm giving up my pride for the promise of new life. And I surrender all to you, all to you. It's not our status, it's not our wealth, it's not our keeping to a form of rules, what we would maybe call good living. But it's an acknowledgement that we need rescue. That it's humble, cross-bearing discipleship that takes us to the kingdom. For no one enters the kingdom of God without God's enabling power. We cannot earn our salvation, not our good enough. We can only receive this gift of grace through faith in Jesus. It only is confessing our sinfulness and our need of rescue to surrender and in that simple childlike faith walk with God. But Jesus looks on us with love. He wants us to receive his gift of grace. He wants to pour more of his Holy Spirit into our lives. But will be worth more than anything and everything here on earth. To talk to you about the Athens. It's almost a hundred years ago. Eric Little, one of the characters of Chariots of Fire, refused to run in the Olympics because the heat was on a Sunday. He had had great success in, in sport, a rugby international playing for Scotland. He had won many medals at 100 metres, 200 metres, at 400 metres. And so he goes, and, and that's part of the story. Part of the story that he, he stood up even to the authorities to say, I will not run on the Sunday. But not long after the Olympics in Paris, in 1925, Eric goes back to China to go back to work with his, his family who were missionaries there, to serve God and who will eventually die in a prison of war camp in, in, in Japan. Once when asked if he regretted the decision to walk away from the fame and the fortune, he replied, it's natural for a chap to think over that sometimes. But I'm glad I'm at the work I'm engaged in now. A fellow's life counts for far more at this than the other. Counts for far more for what we do for God than the fame and fortune. Sydney McLaughlin, a 21 year old female American athlete. She will take place in the Tokyo Olympics. She is the holder of the 400 meter hurdle, the world record 400 meter hurdles. Many eyes are on her, but she wants them to look elsewhere. She said recently, I no longer run for self recognition, but to reflect his perfect will that is already set in stone. I don't deserve anything, but by grace through faith, Jesus has given me everything. Records come and go. The glory of God is eternal. It's about getting things in the right order. It's about getting our hearts set aside for God that everything else falls in the place. I don't deserve anything, she says, but Jesus has given me everything. That's what he offers. 
offers to us this morning. That's how he reminds us of this morning. That in Christ we have everything. More than anything this world can ever give. But are we putting the other stuff first? Are we loving and valuing something more than we, we value our walk with Jesus? Will we lay it down, surrender and receive his love and forgiveness? To put him first, now and always. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you. Thank you for your love and your mercy. Thank you indeed that, that as we read these stories in the Bible, we are reminded it's not about the stuff we have or, or our wealth or status, but instead it is simply about our love for you. Your love for us. And the realisation that there's nothing we can do, that we cannot earn it. But Lord, there's nothing that should take your place in our hearts as first and foremost. Holy Spirit, challenge us all this morning of the things we put before you, of the pleasures we seek, of the, the ambitions, the plans, the the attitudes of our hearts that draw us from the grace that you want to pour in on our lives. And so, Lord, we pray that you might transform us and fill us this morning, renew us, equip us, grant to us your love in all its abundance. For we ask it humbly in Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to close with, as I understand it, a song you have done before. It's one of the new uh, modern songs of creed. But it's a reminder that even as we grow and walk with Jesus, we may come to Christ for our salvation and then we try to be really good. We try to work our way into heaven by our good deeds and our efforts and, and all the rest of it. And yet it is purely God who continues to work in us through his Holy Spirit. He saves us, he makes us right with God and he continues that work of sanctification of continuing to make us more and more like Christ. And we say, yet not I, but through Christ in me, what gift of grace is Jesus my Redeemer? There is no more for heaven now to give. He is my joy, my righteousness and freedom, my steadfast love, my deep and boundless peace. To this I hold, my hope is only Jesus, for my life is only bound to his. Oh, how strange and divine I can sing, all is mine. Yet not I but through Christ in me. We'll stand and sing along, hopefully, the video will appear on the screen.
to Elaine, and Libby, and for all who have helped in organising and preparing for our worship uh, today. When the race is complete, still my lips shall repeat, yet not I, but through Christ in me. He is our hope. He is our everything. May you know his love and forgiveness and mercy today. May the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, the fellowship of the Holy Spirit, rest and abide with you and all who you love now and forevermore. Amen. Please take your seats and wait for the spirits to guide you. Thank mm -hmm. you. 